So you've done your DNA test and you have all these matches. Now you're wondering, well, how many of these matches could I actually see that I'm related to? Well, today we're going to try to answer that question. Howdy, I'm Andy Lee with Family History Fanatics and our question from one of our viewers today is how far distant can I expect reliable cousin matches? Now, this is sort of a loaded question in a way because you got some qualifiers. How far distant? So that gives us some kind of a time frame and expect, okay, well maybe your expectations aren't the same as my expectations. And finally, reliable. So we got three different little qualifiers here that we sort of have to look at, but we're not gonna look at all of them individually because with a question like this, it's really dependent on the specific person and all of those specific issues that you may have relating to these. So instead, let's look at them overall and try to put some numbers on what we might be able to expect. Now, the first place that I like to start with this question and others similar to it is from the 23andMe website. They have an article in their help section called The Probability of Detecting Different Types of Cousins. Now, they're not the only ones who have done this. The other companies have as well, and they come up with slightly different numbers, but I'm gonna use these numbers for now. What this is, is this is a probability that you share DNA with other cousins. So for instance, a first cousin or closer, in other words, your siblings or an aunt and uncle, there's a 100% chance that you share some DNA with them. And in actuality, you actually share a lot of DNA with them. In other words, there is no possibility if you share zero DNA with somebody that they are your first cousin or closer. And that's you know pretty easy to understand because first cousins share grandparents. So they're very closely related. Next is second cousins. Now, the table here says it's greater than 99%. That means that from some statistical analysis, there's a very slight chance that you could have a second cousin that you don't share DNA with. Very, very, very slight chance. However, there hasn't actually been a case of this happening. In other words, a documented second cousin that basically you'd have to be able to prove through DNA that you share the same set of great grandparents and yet these two second cousins don't share any DNA. That has not happened as far as I am aware of. And that's why it's 99% or greater. So in other words, you share DNA with all of your second cousins. You share DNA with all of your first cousins. You share DNA with all of your first cousins once removed because they're in between second cousins and first cousins. Now, once we get to third cousins, then you don't necessarily share DNA with all of them. That's second great grandparents as far as how distant you are. And so there's been enough different recombinations to create you and to create them that it's very possible that you might not share DNA. Now, is it likely? No, because at third cousins, you share DNA with 90% of your third cousins. So if you had 100 third cousins that you were able to identify, you would share DNA with 90 of them. But it goes down from there. Each generation is going to be a little bit less. So with fourth cousins, it's only 45%. With fifth cousins, it's 15%. And by the time you get to sixth cousins, it's less than 5%. So you can imagine if you're looking at 7th, 8th, ninth, 10th cousins, you're going to be looking at less than 1% of all of your 7th, 8th, ninth, and 10th cousins that you share DNA with. Now, I like to put this into numbers that you can understand a little bit. So for instance, when we're talking about first cousins, well, I happen to have 32 first cousins. I have 28 on one side of my family and four on the other side of my family. So with 100% of them, I'm going to share DNA with all 32 of those first cousins. Second cousins basically is 100% also. And here we have to start doing some math and doing some estimating. I just estimated that each generation I have five times as many as before. So I have five times as many second cousins as I do first cousins. 
Now, I have no idea how many second cousins I actually have. Your family may be different. You may actually have a small enough family that you know all of your second cousins, or you may even have a large family that you know all of your second cousins just because your family is that close. But in this case, I have 160 second cousins. I share DNA with all of those. So once I get to third cousins though, even though my numbers are going up, what you'll start to see is that number of matches does not necessarily go up as fast. I have 800 third cousins and I only share DNA with 720 of them. There's 80 of those third cousins I don't share DNA with. And that continues on down the line. You can see fourth cousins. I have 4,000 but only share DNA with 1,800 of them, less than half. Fifth cousins, I got 20,000 of them, but only share DNA with 3,000 of them. Sixth cousins, I have 80,000, but only share DNA with 4,000. And seventh cousins, I might have 400,000 of them, but only share DNA with roughly 4,000 of them. So it's important to recognize that the further distance you go, the less of the total population of cousins that you have you're actually going to match with. Let me expand this chart once more because if I add a column for the percentage of people who've actually had a DNA test, now we can see, okay, how many of these groups of people am I really likely to find? For instance, if I estimate right now about 5% of the, certainly the US population, maybe the US and Europe's population have tested. First cousins, I should really only find about one to two of them. I actually have two of my first cousins that have tested and I didn't have to ask them to test. Second cousins says I should find about eight of them. Third cousins, I should find about 36 of them. Fourth cousins, about 90. Fifth cousins, about 150. 206 cousins and another 207 cousins or beyond. And this is where we can actually start to say, okay, well, what is reliable? Because now we can match this up with our genealogy data, the trees that help us identify who that common ancestor is. Because remember the DNA test is going to tell us that we match somebody and how much DNA we share with them, which may put them in a range of places, but that range can cover lots of different relationships. And so we need to look at trees itself to try to find that. Now, a lot of people are able to trace certain lines back in some cases, 10 or even 20 generations because of certain record sets that are available. But that's not all of your lines. Everybody should be able to get, no, let me start that over. Most people know who their parents are and probably their grandparents, all four of their grandparents. They might be able to know who their great grandparents are. Although if they get started in genealogy and they already know their parents and their grandparents, there probably is a good chance they're going to be able to find who their great grandparents are. And if they're digging into records and their great grandparents are all from areas that actually kept good records over long periods of time, they should be able to find who their great great grandparents are. That's really where third cousins start. You share a set of great great grandparents. So that would be the starting place that I'd say reliability actually happens. And it goes back another couple generations from there, but then you run into the problem of records petering out, not finding them, not being able to tell how these families all fit together. So third cousins, fourth cousins, and fifth cousins is where I say that sweet spot is as far as DNA in identifying actually how these cousins are related to you. That doesn't mean that you can't find more distant cousins in this way but you and them are probably going to have to have tree lines that actually go back several more generations in order to match that up. I know on one of my DNA matches, we have found that we're related actually by, I think it's ninth cousins is what we are. It might even be 10th cousins, I'd have to look. We're not sure yet though, whether or not that is the only relationship that we have. It might be that there's some other lines that we share a relationship on that that DNA might have come down through the ages to each one of us, as opposed to this one that we know that is, like I said, 10th tenth, tenth cousins. So uh, 
ninth great grandparents, um, that, that can be pretty far distant. So this question and looking at these numbers made me think of an example that I could actually use with my own family. What I have here is I have James and Christina. They were a couple that lived and had children back in the 1840s or so in uh, the United States, in New York, and then later in California. And two of their children have descendants, which we have identified today, including myself. This is Benjamin and Christina. And if you've watched a lot of my videos, then you'll actually recognize some of these names because I use this family a lot. They're a fun family to look at. Now, on the Benjamin side, we actually really only have one of Benjamin's descendants and one of his grandchildren's descendants information. And that is through Carl and Burton. Burton happens to be my grandfather. On the other side of the family, Christina, I actually have four different lines of people that I have identified and made contact with. Now, because of the amount of DNA testing that we have done, these are all the people that we have had DNA tested, which is really neat because it's not just looking now at one match, let's say me and one of these people on the other side, but it is actually able to look at really a half a dozen matches to or more to another half a dozen matches or so. And so you end up with lots of different possibilities as far as relationships that we can look at how much DNA is shared between these because we know through you know the triangulation and through other methods, the exact relationship that all these people share with each other. This isn't just a guess. So from this, I made a table and I have one side of the family on one side. That's all these descendants of Burton, my grandfather. And on the other side, I have these descendants of Christina. And as we go through and match up between each of the people, we can see the different relationships. So for instance, Burton and John are the closest. They are second cousins. Whereas we have Ivy and me and my siblings and my cousin, we're all fourth cousins. And then of course, there's the different ones in between from, I think, what would we have here? Second cousins, three times removed to a fourth cousin once removed for my kids to Ivy as well as the others. So I have a table of these different relationships. And so what I can do is I can put some of these numbers to the test. And for that, what I need is I need to know how much DNA all these people share. Now, to, these people tested on different platforms, so I had to go through and check lots of different things back and forth. The grayed out boxes are for my kids that I didn't have any information. They weren't on the same platforms as Glenda and Steven. And so that's why there's no information there. But if there's no number in the box, that means they don't share any DNA. Uh, so ignoring those gray boxes, looking elsewhere, it looks like for the most part, these two families who are separated almost in some cases out to the fourth cousins share DNA across most everybody, but not everybody. And so what I want to do now is I want to go and I'm going to take a look at what percentages actually share DNA. Well, we can see here that with second cousins, well, I expected 100% from the 23andMe data. And guess what? It actually is 100%. With the second cousins once removed, that actually falls in between second cousins and third cousins. So I interpolated there and said that I'd expect about 95%. Well, I actually have 100% of people in this family group that share DNA that are second cousins once removed. Third cousins, which also includes second cousins twice removed, I expect 90%. I only had, as you can see, 95%. Then I get to the one that I actually found most interesting, and I'll tell you why here in a second. That's third cousins once removed which also includes second cousins three times removed. With that, I had 64%, which is almost exactly the 65% that I would expect between a third cousin and a fourth cousin level based on what 23andMe said. Fourth cousins, 
says I should have only 45%, I had 90%. So that's a discrepancy I've got to figure out why. And fourth cousin once removed, you said I should only have 25%. I actually had 80%. So why do I see some discrepancies? Now with the lower ones, second cousins, second cousins once removed and third cousins, there's really not much of a discrepancy. I mean, when, when we're talking about the numbers that I have, it's not that much different, but 45% is half of 90% and 25% is what a little less than a third or a little more than a third a little less than a third of 80 percent. so those are big discrepancies well to understand that you have to go back over to the number of instances i had to look at with these two families now remember i'm comparing i think what uh, 10 12 people on one side with five people on the other side and so each one of these relationships is a data point there's about 50 data points here only one of those falls into that second cousin category, but it's 100% and I'm not worried about that. The second cousins once removed, there were eight people that fell into that. Now you'd expect 95%. Well, eight's not enough to actually get always what you would expect as far as that 95%. So the fact that I had all eight that shared isn't really a big surprise statistically from these numbers. If I had a lot more, let's say if I had 20 or 30, well, then I would expect to see one or two that did not share DNA. But with the one numbers that I have, it would just be luck that I would not. Now, third cousins, second cousins, twice removed, that group, I had 20 that actually shared DNA out of 21 possible. Now, this one, there should be about 90%. So I, I might have one more, but actually for this number, 20 out of 21, that's, that's something that is within a, a very expected range for that. The third cousins once removed and second cousins three times removed, I told you was the one that I liked the best. Now, the reason why I like this the best is because I had the most possible ones. There was 25 possibilities. And at this level, I was expecting about 65%, which is far enough away from, from you know, the 90% or so that... I should be able to see it with 25. And in fact, I only had 16 of these 25 that shared DNA. So this was a really good data point from a statistical standpoint. I have enough people that don't share DNA and it fit right within what I was expecting. So then we get to the two, the two bottom ones. And these were outliers. Remember the first one I share 90%, I was only expecting 45%. And the last one, I shared 80%, I was only expecting 25%. So what is going on here? Well, the first thing you might say is, oh, well, the numbers are really low. There's only 10 and five, except that because the percentages are so much different, 10 people should be enough that I only have five that share it. So that is still a discrepancy and the small numbers don't really explain that. Same thing with five. I should only be really having one, maybe two of those people that, that share the same amount uh, as that. And I have four. And so that's a discrepancy that I should be able to see even though I have low numbers. Well, the answer here has to do with the fact that well, these aren't randomly distributed. These are between two specific families. And in one case, you have that family, I actually have represented by four lines. In the other case, it's only represented by one line of descent from that. And so in this case, that line of descent happened to have received enough DNA to actually boost these numbers up higher. That's what I'm going with right now. Another interesting thing then to take a look at this is what the low, what the high, and what the average amount was for each one of these groups. Now, what we'd expect is we'd expect that the average amount is going to go down. We would expect that the high amount is also going to go down. And we would expect that the low amount should go down too initially. So let's take a look here and see. And yeah, if we're looking at the average at second cousins, 217, because there was only one person, so it was easy. It goes down to 96, which is about half. That's what we would expect. It goes down to 56, which is a little more than half. Then it only goes down to 42.8 which yes, it's lower, but it's not, you know, as much as we thought. And then we go to the fourth cousins and that doesn't quite go down in half. And then fourth cousins once removed doesn't 
he goes down a little bit, but not quite in half. The reason why we're not seeing these numbers half each time when we get to third cousins and below is because we're only including those that actually share DNA. If we included those who don't share DNA, in other words, the zeros, then we would actually see numbers that are a lot closer to halving each time. The next is when we look at the high numbers, we see that yes, this starts to go down and it looks like it's going down about 30 to 40 each time until we get down to the lower, the lower uh, numbers when we just about 20 because there's just not as much DNA to go down by. But what we can see already is that in the fourth cousin level, which includes those third cousins twice removed, 51.2 centimorgans is the highest. And it's going to be hard to identify how exactly that person is related to you if that's the only match that you have. On the other hand, if we look over at the lows, what we see is starting right at third cousins, the low is about 15, 14, 15, 16, and it stays right there in that same range for most of the time. Now, this is also the time when we start to see people that we don't match at all. In other words, that have zero centimorgans shared. So you might be wondering, why aren't I seeing something lower than 15 centimorgans? So for instance, like a seven centimorgan or a 10 centimorgan. By the time we get segments that are down this small, 15 centimorgans, it's much more likely that we lose that segment completely or pass that segment on completely than to have it chopped up in different ways. Because of the small numbers, I'm not gonna start seeing those other little ones. I'd actually have to have a lot more samples in a lot of these to see things that are 10 centimorgans or seven centimorgans in this range. So what can we learn from all of this? Well, let's start with the first lesson that we should learn. And that one's really easy. You want to test the oldest family members. We can go back to that first graph that I saw and you can see that Burton, the oldest on my family, my grandfather, well, he shared the most DNA with every single one of these people. But not only that, with every single one of these people, it actually was a significant amount of DNA. The lowest was Stephen with 75 centimorgans, which many people, if they had a match of 75 centimorgans, would be ecstatic. But he also has matches of over 100, 170, and then 217 in one case with his second cousin. Now, I want to say here, this side of the family, we didn't know anything about until DNA testing. So let's think for a second if my grandfather's DNA was not available. Well, I could always have my father's DNA tested, which you'll see he shares DNA with everybody. Although there's a couple of these, Glenda and Stephen, that it's really only a small amount. Even though his father shared 136 centimorgans with Glenda, he only got 25 centimorgans of that. So it's not as good as his father, obviously, but 75, 60, 70 centimorgans for some of these people is still really good. Next one is my aunts and uncles. You can see here, most all of them share DNA with most everybody. There's actually only one instance of one of them not sharing DNA with one of these other family members. Now these people would all be what, like second cousins once removed or third cousins, I think in some cases. So we're actually in the area where we would expect some of these to drop off. So for instance, if Gloria's was the only DNA I had, I wouldn't match with Glenda. And so I'd never have her in this group of people that are related through the same line because she wouldn't show up at all. So lesson number two that I want to bring to you is test as many family members as possible. Let's take a look back at our graph and look at actually one of my sons. If he was the only one tested, the three people, John, Randy, and Ivy, that I know are in the databases that he is in, he doesn't share any DNA with any of them. So we would never be able to connect with that family if his DNA was the only one. And if you look at Glenda and Steven, I share 22.1 and 25 centimorgans with each one of them it's entirely possible that he might not have gotten any of that DNA either. And so he might not share any DNA with this entire side of the family, which this is only, you know, 
fourth cousins, I believe, or fourth cousins once removed as far as how distant he is related to them. It's not fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth cousins. This is just in this fourth cousin range. Another thing to take a look at is just all of my kids. John, who actually is the most closely related, he's second cousins with my grandfather, so I would be second cousins twice removed, and my kids would be second cousins three times removed. Only two of my five kids share any DNA with John. That's it. The other three don't share any DNA with him. Now, John was the one that we initially used to help identify this side of the family. So, if Dos, Trace, or Cinco were the only DNA that we had, we never would have matched with them. And this illustrates, I think, why you should not only test the oldest generation first, but also spread it wide and test as many of your family members. Not just your immediate family members, but cousins, aunts, and uncles as well. Because they will help to open the doors to some of these other matches that maybe your DNA and your close family members' DNA doesn't have. So, in answer to the question, reliably, what you can expect, I would say you can expect around the third to fifth cousin level of what DNA is going to be able to help you identify. It still is dependent on yourself, and it's also dependent on whatever kind of family tree you have been able to put together. So if you have any questions, be sure to put them in the comments below and make sure you hit that like button and share the video with others. Now, if you would like to learn something else about DNA, then you can check out this video up here. But if you want to see one of our other genealogy videos about building a tree, why don't you check this video down below? There's no intro to these videos because Devin decided to change it and there's not an intro.